It's good to see you. I hope that you're doing well. I hope the first part of your week has gone well. I want to begin by asking you something. How many of you, as young children, engaged in a bit of make-believe at one time or other? You know what I mean. Uh, if you were a young lady, perhaps you had a tea party with some imaginary friends, or maybe you dressed up as a princess and you had, you had thought about all of that and how you were being a part of this fairy tale. If you were a young man, maybe it was out on a baseball diamond. You took that bat and you pointed it out to outfield, imitating maybe your favorite player. You were going to try to knock that ball over that fence, and you were make-believing that that was going to be you. I dare say that all of us, at one time or another, have let our imaginations have free reign in our lives. Even today, Many of us are able to watch our children or our grandchildren as they do some of the same things, only maybe with different characters or different costumes, but they like to make believe. It's, health, it's healthy for them. At some point, though we wish that we could maybe stay in our imaginary world, we realize that we have, we're called back into reality. We have to come back into the world that we actually live. And the world in which we live, we know, is not as exciting as this make-believe realm that we have come up with. The book that I want us to spend some time studying over the next few weeks is a book called, you know it by the title of Ecclesiastes. And basically what the author is doing is he is calling us into the real world. And he is forcing us to face our unpleasant realities in which we live and to stop and ask ourselves, what am I gaining in life? What am I profiting in life? If you read the book, you probably have already come to the conclusion that's a pretty pessimistic book. It can be kind of dark at times, some of the things that he says. But what the writer is doing is he's challenging us to live our lives as if we're at the end of our life and looking back over our lifetime and then saying, okay, this is how, knowing what the end is like, this is how I need to be living my life. And from that vantage point, we can see how our lives should be lived. One individual that writes on this book, writes about it, call, has titled his book, Living Life Backward. Looking at your life if you, as if you were at the very end of it and you can look back over your life and suddenly say, whoa, I should have done this and I should have done that and that's not quite as important as I thought it was going to be and that doesn't matter at all when it comes to where I'm going with my life. So what I want to do is encourage you tonight to spend some time with me over the next few weeks as we look at this book and, and try to discern some of the things that the author has given us. If you open your Bible and you look at it, there's a title in your Bible. There's a, there are two titles that often are given to it. One is the Hebrew. The Hebrew word in the original language is Koheleth. It is a name that means, as you can see up here, preacher or speaker in the assembly. The other name that we're much more familiar with comes from the Greek translation of the Old Testament scriptures, and it is the term Ecclesiastes. That's the way we've always named it. And it is a word that comes out of the Greek term ecclesia, from which we get church, or those who are called out, the called out assembly. And what this term means is it means a member of the church, or a leader of the assembly. So what you find when you open and begin reading in your Bibles is that most of our translations have given a title to this individual because it's about the individual who writes it. The title is The Preacher. And as you're reading through Ecclesiastes, you keep encountering The Preacher. But who is The Preacher? Well, he describes himself. He tells us a little bit about himself in chapter 1 and all the way over in the very end of the book. But first of all, in chapter 1, the very first verse of chapter 1, he describes himself as being the son of David 
king in Jerusalem. A little further down in verse 12 of chapter 1, he comes again and says that he is king over Israel in Jerusalem. In, in verse 16, he states, I have magnified and increased wisdom more than all who were over me before, over Jerusalem before me. So he indicates he's a pretty wise individual. And then if you read in chapter 2, verses 4 through 8, he presents himself as being someone who is very wealthy. And then in verse 9, he even adds this, I became great and increased more than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. If you go all the way to the end of the book, chapter 12, last chapter of the book, you look there in verse 9, he writes that in addition to being a wise man, calls himself the preacher, the preacher also taught the people knowledge. And he pondered, searched out, and arranged many proverbs. Well, who does this describe? Someone that was a son of David, king over Israel, wise, wealthy, had a lot of proverbs attributed to them. The most evident man, Solomon, son of David, king, third king over Israel. And two things we know about Solomon. One is if you go to First Solomon chapter, or excuse me, First Solomon, First Kings chapter three, and you read there, you find that there's a prayer that Solomon prays to God. He asks God, God tells him to ask whatever he wants of him. And he asks God for wisdom. And because he asks God for wisdom, God not only gives him wisdom, he also gives him riches and honor, as he tells us there. The other thing that we find is if you go one chapter over in 1 Kings to chapter 4, there in verse 32, there we're told that Solomon also spoke 3,000 proverbs. So it, it pretty much kind of defines who this individual is. The preacher is Solomon. And Solomon writes this book. He reigned from about 971 B.C. down to 931 B.C., 40 years. And it makes sense that he would write this book probably toward the end of his life at a period of time after he was able to reflect upon his experiences, his life experiences, and what lessons he had learned from those experiences. But what does he say as you open the book and you begin reading? Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. What does he mean? All is vanity. What does he mean by that statement? Well, first of all, what is vanity? The word that is translated vanity in the original language, in the Hebrew language, is a word that means vapor. It means breath. That's what it means. Just a, a vapor, a breath. As a matter of fact, one commentator describes this word as meaning a wisp of vapor, a puff of wind, a mere breath, nothing you can get your hands on, the nearest thing to zero. Well, this is what Solomon is saying. Breath of breaths, all is just a mere breath. And, and, and as he says this, all is vanity or breath or vanity of vanities, he is doing something that we find so often in the Old Testament. You've heard the term king of kings, lord of lords, or holy of holies. What is it saying? Well, the Holy of Holies was the place where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. It was also known as the Most Holy. In other words, it is the highest you can go. King of Kings means king above whom there is no other king. Lord of Lords means Lord above whom there is no other Lord. So vanity of vanities means the utmost of vanities. The, uh, the most... How's the word that I want to say? the merest of breaths that you can imagine. And David in the Psalms describes our lives as that breath. So one of the things that Solomon is telling us as he speaks about vanity of vanities and all is vanity, he wants us to begin by understanding as we open up this book, folks, that life is short. David brings that out. In, in Psalm 39, first of all in verse 5 and then again in verse 11. In verse 5 what David said is, Behold, you have made my days as hand and my life 
My lifetime is nothing in your sight. Surely man is at best a mere breath. He says that's all we are. Down in verse 11 of that same passage, he says, With reproofs you chasten a man for iniquity. You consume as a moth what is precious to him. Surely every man is a mere breath. Another passage that David writes, Psalm 144, verses 3 and 4. In that psalm, David again compares our lives to a mere breath and our days to a passing shadow. Let me ask you, have you ever seen someone blow out a candle? Birthday candle, candle that they've got maybe just in the house. You ladies, a lot of times you like your candles and you'll light your candles and when you have other guests coming over and then when everybody's gone, you blow out the candles. Blow out the candle and what do you find? A little puff of smoke, isn't there? Blow out the candle, a little puff of smoke. I'm not going to ask, I see. A little puff of smoke comes off the candle. But then it's gone, isn't it? Folks, that's the idea. When Solomon says, our lives, vanity of vanities, all is vanity, He's saying, your life is short. It's real. Just like the, that puff of smoke, it's real. You can see it. You can smell it. But then suddenly it's gone. And the point is, our lives are the same way. If you look at verse 4, he says, a generation comes, a generation, and a genera or a generation goes, and a generation comes. But the earth remains forever. Most of us have heard statements like, here today, gone tomorrow, haven't we? Or maybe some of you have even said this yourself, the older I get, the faster time flies. Where did life go? It seemed like just yesterday I was doing this or that or whatever it may be. And now look at where I'm at. Life is short. It's a mere breath. But then the second thing, when he says vanity, of vanity all is vanity, he wants us to know something else about life. It is the fact that life is elusive. Look at the statement he makes in verse 3. He says, What does a man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? That's from the English Standard Version. The word there in verse 3 that is translated gain. What may a man does a man gain? It is the word that, that same word is translated in the King James and New King James as the word profit. The New American Standard uses the word advantage, but what does it mean? It means what's left over. It means the surplus. And, and the thing about this word, why it's so important, it's the only place it's found in the Old Testament. That word is not found anywhere else other than in this book in the Old Testament. And so, Another way we might phrase Solomon's question here is this, what profit, what gain, what lasting significance are we able to point to as a result of our toiling, our laboring here on this earth? And when he uses the word toil or labor, he's speaking about laboring to the point of exhaustion. You work and you work and you work and you labor. And when you, all is said and done and when you get through with all of that, what you can you point back to and say, this is my profit. This is my gain. This is what I've accomplished. Psalm 90 is a psalm written by Moses. And if you look in that psalm down in verse 10, Moses writes about the days of our lives and the pride that comes from them or that we have at the end of them. He says, as for the days of their, our lives, they contain 70 years or if due to strength, 80 years. Yet what? Their pride is but labor and sorrow, for soon it is gone, and we what? We fly away. So he's saying, what is our gain from all of our toil, from all of our labor? Solomon is asking, and his point is that we can pour our whole lives into something, and that something may be successful, or that something may fail, but the truth is we have little control over the outcome of so much in our lives. Is that not true? How many of you know somebody that started out with what they thought was a good job? Thought they had everything going for them. 
And then one day they suddenly find out, closing the plant, you're going to have to look for a job somewhere else. Well, I bought a house. I've invested. I've got debts to pay. What am I going to do? Could they control that? No. Had no control over that. Many of you know that happened here in this community many years ago. What about the person that just as healthy as a horse? And one day they walk into the doctor, and the doctor's doing a routine physical, and he says, I need to talk to you. You've got cancer. We need to address it immediately. Really? No. I've always ate right. I've always tried to take care of myself. I've always made sure I got plenty of exercise. I've got cancer? Yeah. Can you control that? No. You know, how many of us can tell someone else exactly where we're going to be five years from now, ten years from now? I dare say that if you ask a number of people from this community a year and a half ago, where are you going to be in five years? Well, I'm going to be living right here in this house, as far as I know. And that house isn't there anymore. They had no control over the outcome. And this is what Solomon is saying. Life is elusive as it's lived under the sun. That term is important, lived under the sun. As we live it here, we don't have control over a lot of things that we wished we did. David, another psalm by David, Psalm 103, there in verses 15 and 16, he writes, As for a man, his days are like grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourishes. When the wind is passed over, it is no more, and his place, its place acknowledges it no longer. We think we've got the tiger by the tail, so to speak. We think we've got everything taken care of. We think we've got all of our plans made, but then something happens that we have no control over. Remember Joseph, age of 17, sold by his own brothers into slavery. Do you think he ever thought they would have done that to him? And then he spends 13 years as a slave and a prisoner in Egypt. Did he have control over that? No. He did not. So Solomon, and, and as I said, it, he can be kind of pessimistic or so it seems. Another thing he tells us is something else about life when he speaks about all being vanity. It is that life is repetitive. And he uses here, notice these, this passage, first of all, here in, as we pick up with verse 5, he says, Also, the sun rises and the sun sets, and hastening to its place it rises there again, blowing toward the south, turning toward the north. The wind continues swirling along on its circular course. The wind returns. All the rivers flow into the sea, yet the sea is not full. To the place where the rivers flow, there they flow again. In these verses, what Solomon does is he focuses on life as it relates to our natural world by utilizing three aspects of nature, sun, wind, and water. Notice what he says about the sun. The sun rises in the east. Now, we understand, don't we? Actually, the sun doesn't rise and set. It's the, 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 the earth turning on its axis. But it appears to rise in the east and set in the west. And then what happens? It races, as he says, to do it all over again. So what's going to happen? Tomorrow morning, Lord, provided the Lord doesn't turn, return, the sun's going to rise. That's the east, by the way. And it's going to set over here in the west. And what's going to happen the next day? The sun's going to rise in the east. It's going to set in the west. And the next day, and the next, and on and on it goes. And so what is he saying? We've all seen it. Same activity over and over again. It's repetitive. It's, and this cycle, Solomon is saying, is, it's, it's, it's vanity. It's just the same thing over and over again. David looked at the rising and setting of the sun a little bit different. If you look at Psalm 19, 
David spoke about God preparing a tent in the heavens for the sun. And then there in verse 5, he speaks of the sun as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and then says it rejoices as a strong man to run its course. He, he, he attributes that to God, but Solomon is talking about the repetitive nature of what you see over and over and over again. The other thing is the wind. And what does he say about the wind? The wind blows to the south and turns and blows to the north. And we've seen that on many a weather map, haven't we, as we watch to see what the weather's going to hold. And they'll pull up a map of, our, of the U.S. and you'll see these, these swirls. Well, that's, that's the wind blowing. That's the weather patterns as they're coming across. And he says, this is the way it works. And it does it over and over again. Rivers do what? They flow into the sea. And then by the process of evaporation and precipitation, that water that evaporated, had flowed in the sea, is back over the land, and it once again is released, and it flows into the rivers, and as he says, it does it all over again. It flows back toward the sea. And he says, this is the way it works. This is the way it has always worked, and this is the way it always will work. This is the same repetitive thing over and over and over again. So when you come to verse 8, and you read through verse 11, he speaks about the weariness that we have because of all of this. All things are wearisome. Man is not able to tell it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. That which has been is that which will be. That which has been done is that which will be done. There is nothing new under the sun. Now let me stop there for just a moment. He says it's weariness. Why? Because we see it over and over and over again. And there is a, no point at which he says we can be satisfied with seeing and hearing. I've seen everything I want to see. I've heard everything I want to hear. It, it, we just keep getting the same. Nothing new under the sun. And isn't that true? Even today, we may say, well, now wait a minute, we've put men on the moon and we've done this and we've done that, but yeah, we have. But then we keep doing some of the same things over and over again. In our age of modern technology, things that are state of the art today will soon be outdated because of how technology is changing. We invent, but then how long before we become tired of the invention and long for something better? We, we discover, but how long is it before that discovery is old news to us? Oh yes, that, I've seen that. That's old. Give me something new. Give me something that, that, that I haven't seen before. And if you'll notice what he goes on to say, is there anything of which one might say, see, this, it is new. Already it has existed for ages which were before us. There is no remembrance of earlier things and also of the latter things which will occur. There will be far more, or excuse me, there will be for them no remembrance among those who will come later still. How many of us have been around a young person who suddenly discovers something that they've never seen before and they believe it to be new? I remember something Keith told me years ago about one of his daughters in class. She came home. She said, Dad, they had this huge CD in class. It was, it, was, it was about this big, and it was black. I've never seen one like that before. He had to tell her that that was a, an LP record. Oh, something that many of us grew up around seeing it all the time. That's not new, that's old. But to that young lady, it was new. She had never seen it before. She had never had any remembrance of it before. And I'm sure all of us have done the same thing with another young person, something that we're familiar with. My wife and I, years ago, after we first adopted our children, took them down to a little old country grocery store over in Hickman County, sat down on a creek out in the country. Tarkington's Grocery, if you're familiar with Hickman County, 
since closed, went into that store, and many of you have been to the drink boxes that, you remember these old drink boxes that had the bottles? You had to work them around, and then you could finally pull it out. And then you had this little thing on the side that you put it in and popped the lid off. Well, I looked over there, and my son had the bottle in his mouth and trying to get that thing off. I said, no, no, use that right there. He looked at it. He didn't know what to do with that thing. I took the bottle and said, here's what you do. Put it in, and you would thought, wow. We have used those for years. Many of us, they're not around much anymore. But to us, it was second nature. Put it in the machine, pop that little top off, and there you go. You're good to go. Of course, glass bottles is something we're familiar with. Today's generation Glass Coke bottles. What? Glass Coke bottles? Y'all had glass Coke bottles? Yeah. Some of those things are coming back. But the, the point is this, and this is what he's saying. The young person discovers something they believe they've never seen before. They believe it to be new. The older person says, no, that's been here. It's been around for years. And we proceed to tell them how it works. And for them, they have no remembrance of these earlier things because they weren't around when they came along. And in the same way, as he points out right here at the end, and also of the latter things which will occur, there will be for them no remembrance among those who will come later still. What he's saying is some things that they will see. There will be another generation comes up. I've never seen that. Oh, yeah, this is what this is. Folks, there will be a generation after many of us are gone that will say to another generation when they come up, what's this little thing that has all this, these two spools and it has this little tape looking thing in it? That's a cassette. What? Never heard of that. Never seen one of those before. Or what's this thing that you put in? You know, it's, it's kind of shiny, and that's a CD. What's a CD? You see, we see these things, and what he's saying is nothing new under the sun. It's all the same. And as you read these words, and I'm going to stop there in verse 11, but as you read these words that Solomon writes, it's easy to come away disappointed and even uh, to some extent feeling a little pessimistic about life. And what Solomon is doing, I want you to notice that what he's doing is he is describing life under the sun. Why under the sun? Because the sun is a creation of God. It marks time, doesn't it? We know when the sun rises, it's daytime. When the sun sets, it's nighttime. We mark time. We mark our days by the rising and the setting of the sun. And it's his way of saying that as long as this earth lasts, in this period of time, in the here and now, as we live life, this is the way things are. There are things that you're going to be disappointed in. There are things that frustrate you. There is a life that you don't always have control over. And, and, and we, in this world in which we live, we do the same things over and over and over again. And the point he's making is that mil millions of people are trying to find satisfaction in this world, in this materialistic world. And, and they keep expecting that somewhere behind the obvious benefits of the material things in which they have engaged themselves, they're going to find some hidden greater joy. And Solomon is saying, not going to happen. You're not going to discover what you think you want or what you really are seeking because that's not where it's going to be found. The truth is, because you have limited your, yourself to life under the sun, you're going to be caught up in this cycle that keeps you from ever being truly satisfied. Because you're always looking to be satisfied with what this world can provide. And it can't do it. It won't do it. For those of us here tonight who are Christians, we know that life is not vain, don't we? Remember what the Apostle Paul said to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. He told them to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Why? For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 
our labor as Christians while we are here upon this earth, we are, we are restricted to the same limitations that everybody else upon this, world, in this, on this planet is restricted to. But what we're doing has an ultimate outcome. It has an eternal reward. It's not in vain in the Lord. It has a profit to it. That's why Paul said that he pressed on toward the upward call of the prize or the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He knew there was something beyond life here under the sun. And if you look in Mark's gospel, chapter 8, beginning in verse 34, Mark tells us about a time when Jesus summoned the crowd along with his disciples, and he said something to them. He said, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. You see, there's the idea of the chasing after life under the sun. If you're trying to find satisfaction, if you're trying to find fulfillment, if you're trying to find the answer to everything you seek in this life under the sun, as Solomon would call it, you're going to lose it. But then he says, whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. And then he asked a question, a question that could have just as easily come from Solomon at the end of his life. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world? Remember that idea of gain? What is gain? To gain the whole world and forfeit his soul. And what will a man give in exchange for his soul? You see, you and I have the privilege of looking at life above the sun. We have the privilege of looking at life beyond this realm. Because our citizenship, if we're Christians, is not of this realm. Our citizenship is in heaven. And as Paul says to the Philippians, we are eagerly looking for a Savior. The Lord Jesus Christ. And when He comes, He's going to transform our bodies into bodies like His glorious body. So we're not confined to this life under the sun. We have something far better. And we have a beautiful message to share with others. But maybe tonight as you're here and you're listening to this, maybe you're a person who is looking for something better that this world cannot offer you. I want you to know that it's found in Christ. That, that eternal, everlasting life is found in Christ. Peace, true peace, inner peace found in Christ, comfort found in Christ, joy, joy this world cannot provide because in this world Jesus himself said we have tribulation, but then he said be of good courage for I have overcome the world. He gives us joy. Those are the things which exist above the sun and even here while we're here, but they're given to us by one who lives outside of this realm. My question to you tonight is, are you a person who's seeking those things? If you are, I hope that you will come to Christ in obedient faith. I pray that tonight you will be willing to turn from a life that's been lived apart from Him, confess Him as your Lord and Savior, and be buried with Him in baptism. If you need to respond to that invitation, we invite you to come. As together we stand and sing.